we've run Berkshire now for 47 years. Uh, there have been several times, oh, four or five times when we've thought it was significantly undervalued. Uh, we saw the price get cut in half uh, at least four times, or roughly in half, in fairly short periods of time. And I would say this, if you run any business for a long period of time, there are going to be times when it's, it's overvalued and sometimes when it's undervalued. Tom Murphy ran one of the most successful companies the world's ever seen, and in the early 1970s, his stock was selling for about a third of what you could have sold the properties for. And, you know, Berkshire, back in 2000, uh, 2001, whenever it was, that I wrote in the annual report that we were also going to repurchase shares, was selling at uh, what I thought was a very low price, and we didn't get any repurchased. But that stocks, the beauty of stocks is they do sell at silly prices from time to time. I mean, that's, that's how Charlie and I have gotten rich. You know, Ben Graham writes about it in Chapter 8 of, of, uh, of The Intelligent Investor. You know, next, uh, uh, well, Chapters 8 and Chapters 20 are, are really all you need to do to get rich in this world. And Chapter 8 says that in the market, you're going to have a partner named Mr. Market. And the beauty of him as your partner is that he's kind of a psychotic drunk. And... <laughs> And he will do very weird things over time. And your job is to remember that he's there to serve you and not to advise you. And if you can keep that mental state, that all those thousands of prices that Mr. Market is offering you every day on every major business in the world, practically, that he is making lots of mistakes. And he makes them for all kinds of weird reasons. And uh, all you have to do is occasionally oblige him when he offers to either buy or sell from you at the same price on any given day, any given security. So it's built into the system that stocks get mispriced. And Berkshire has been no exception to that. I think Berkshire, generally speaking, has come closer to selling around its intrinsic value over a 47-year period or so uh, than most large companies, if you look at the range from our high to low in a given year and compare that to the range high and low on 100 other stocks, I think you'll find that our stock fluctuates somewhat less than most, which is a good sign. But uh, I, I will tell you, in the next 20 years, Berkshire will someday be significantly overvalued and some, at some point significantly undervalued. And... Uh, uh, that will be true for Coca-Cola and Wells Fargo and IBM and all of the other securities that, that I, I, don't, I just don't know in which order and at which times. But the important thing is that you, you, you make your decisions based on what you think the business is worth. And if you make your buy and sell decisions based on what you think a business is worth and you stick with businesses that you think you've got good reason to think you can value, you simply have to do well in stocks. The stock market is the most obliging, money-making uh, place in the world because you don't have to do anything. You know, you sit there with thousands of businesses being priced at the same price for the buyer and the seller, and, you don't, and it changes every day, and you've got lots of information about most of those businesses, and you don't have to do anything. You know, compare that to any other investment alternative you've got. I mean, you can't do that with farms. If you own a farm and the guy has the farm next to you and you kind of like to buy him out or something, he, he's not going to name a price every day at which he'll buy your farm or sell you his farm. But you can do that with, you know, you can do it with Berkshire Hathaway or IBM. It's, it's a marvelous game. I mean, the rules are stacked in your favor if, if you don't turn those rules upside down and start behaving like the drunken psychotic instead of the guy that's there to take advantage of him. Charlie? Well, what's interesting about this place is that I think we've had a lot more fun when we got rich enough, so we bought businesses and stocks to hold instead of to resell. It's an enormously more constructive life. So as fast as you can work yourself into our position, the better off you'll be. And you should be very encouraged by the fact that 
he's only 88 and I'm only 81, just think, <laughs> it may take you a little while. <laughs> Cliff? So I guess also along those lines, we talk about the, the, uh, the drunken market. Have systemic fear risk or uh, systemic risk fears ever caused you to pause in your eagerness to buy equities? Um, you know, back in 2008, 2009, you know, were you, why weren't you more aggressive back then? Yeah. You'll probably find this interesting. Charlie and I, to my memory, in 53 years, I don't think we've ever had a discussion about buying a stock or a business or selling a stock or a business that has been where, where we've talked about macro affairs. I mean, it, it, if we find a business that we think we understand and we like the price at which it's being offered, we buy it. And it doesn't make any difference what the headlines are. It doesn't make any difference what the Federal Reserve is doing. It doesn't make any difference what's going on in Europe. We buy it. You know, there's always going to be good and bad news out there. And which gets emphasized the most, uh, is, you know, depends on the moods of people or newspaper editors or uh, whomever. And there's, you know, there's a ton of bad. I bought my first stock, you know, in in in, uh, in June of. In, in June of 42, and uh, uh, you know what had happened? You know, we were losing the war, you know, until the Battle of Midway. I mean, it, it, so here was a, a country that, every, you know, all, all my older friends had gone, you know, were disappeared. We weren't going to make any kinds of goods that were people wanted. We were going to build battleships and things to drop in the sea, and we were losing, you know. But stocks were cheap, <laughs> and. Uh, I wrote that article in October of 2008 in the Times. That I should have written a few months later, but, but it, I, in the end, I said we've just had a financial panic and it's going to flow over into the economy. And you know, you're going to read all kinds of bad news, but so what? You know, America's not going to go away, and stock, stocks are cheap. You got to. We look to value, and we don't look to headlines at all. And we really don't. Everybody thinks that we sit around and talk about macro factors. I, we, we don't have any discussions about macro factors. Charlie? Yeah, but we did keep liquid reserves oh, yeah, at the bottom of the panic that if we'd known it was not going to get any worse, we would have spent. But that's, because we didn't know that. Yeah, we, 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 all, we know what we don't know. and we, we, all, we, we know we don't want to go broke. I mean, we start with that. And we know you can't go broke if you've got a, a fair amount of liquid reserves around and you don't have any near-term debts and so on. So. Our first rule is always to play it tomorrow, no matter what happens. Uh, but if we've got that covered and we can find things that are attractive, we buy it. Well, Charlie has a little company called the Daily Journal Company, and he sat there with a whole lot of cash. And, and when 2008 came along, he went out and bought a few stocks. He won't tell me the names of them, but uh, uh, and he, you know, that was the time to use the money, not to sit on it. <coughs> Was that the name of a stock, Charlie? <laughs> you don't get anything out of them. Station 7. Mr. B Mr. Buffett, Mr. Munger, thank you for your inspiration and insight. Uh, when you look at the stable of businesses that Berkshire owns, which business has greatly Im improved its competitive p position over the last five years and why? And then conversely, perhaps you might name a business that was not so lucky. Yeah, yeah. We don't like to dump on the other, on the ones that aren't that haven't done as well. But there's no question. And fortunately, the big ones have the, the big ones have done well. There's no question that even though we didn't, well, we didn't own all of it. We actually have owned a significant piece of Burlington Northern over the last five. But the railroad business, for very fundamental reasons, which I should have figured out earlier. Uh, has improved its position dramatically over the last maybe 15 or 20 years, but it's, it, it continues to this day. I mean, it is an extremely efficient and environmentally friendly way of moving a whole lot of things that have to be moved. And uh, it's a, an asset that couldn't be duplicated for, you name it, three, four, five, six times you know what it's selling for, so that it's it's uh, it's a whole lot better business than it was five or ten years ago. Now Geico's a whole lot better business 
than it was five or ten years ago, although I think you could have predicted that the chances were good that that was going to happen. But, you know, we have, we're approaching 10 percent of the market now. And you go back to 1995, we had 2 percent of the market. We had the ingredients in place to become much larger. And then fortunately, we had Tony Nicely, who absolutely maximized what was there to be, uh, uh, to be done. And uh, Geico's worth billions and billions and billions of dollars more than when we bought it. And the Burlington is worth considerable billions more than when we bought it, even though it was recently. Mid-American has done a great job. We bought that stock at 34 or so dollars a share in 1999, and I think we appraise it now at around $250 a share, and that's in the utility business. Uh, so this car has been wonderful since we bought it. We bought that six years ago, and, and uh, uh, they just don't stop. You know, they do everything well, and I would not want to compete with them. Uh, so we've, there, there are a number of them, and... We're having 80% or so of our businesses, by value at least, increased their market strength. Yeah, by value, I would say more than 80%. More than 80%, yeah. yeah. So yeah by, not by number, but by value. By value. We're not suffering at all. Yeah. We're never going to get the rate disease 100%. And the mistakes have been made in the purchasing. I mean, it, it's where I misgaged the competitive position of the business. It isn't because of the faults of management. It's, it's because I just, either because I had too much money around or because I was, you know, been drinking too much Sherry Coke or whatever it was, uh, I assessed the future competitive position in a way that was really inappropriate. But it wasn't because it really changed on me so much. And, you know, we've, we've done some of that. Uh, but the big ones, the big ones have worked out very well. Gen Re, which looked like real problems for some years. I mean, it, Tad is running a fabulous operation there. Ajit has created something from nothing that's worth tens of billions of dollars. And, and it, you know, he, he, he created that out of walking into the office in 1985 and, and, and entering the insurance business for the first time. But he just brought brains and energy and character to something. And we backed him with some money. And he's created a business like nobody I've never seen. Charlie? Well, we've been very fortunate. And uh, what's interesting is the good fortune is not going to go away merely because Warren happens to die. <laughs> well, it won't help him, but what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You'll have an explanation of that in the second half of this. Uh, <laughs> Becky? <laughs> Uh, this question comes from Joel Bannister in Dallas, Texas, who says, Warren, you personally run the derivative book. Who will manage these weapons of mass destruction after your tenure? We don't want to end up like AIG under someone else's watch. He also adds, P.S., I am wearing the wedding ring you sold my wife last year at the annual meeting at Borsheim's. Well, obviously a man of intelligence. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I don't think, I don't think there'll be much of a derivatives book after I'm around. In fact, there won't be much of a derivatives book while I am around. I mean, it's not that, it, it's not that big a deal. But there will be, there could well be. Well, I'll, I'll go back to there will be because it's almost required in certain of our utility operations that they engage in certain types of derivative activities. The the utility boards that they respond to want them to hedge out certain types of activities. And then they, they engage in swaps of, 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 of uh, generation. And uh, there's, there are a number of activities that there are some derivatives that fit into doing that. But it's not of a huge scope. The, the railroad uh, formerly hedged, hedged diesel fuel, for example. And they, they may do that in the future. They may not. I mean, that. Uh, so there's a few operating businesses that will have minor positions. Uh, I don't think that, I think it's unlikely that whoever follows me, well, they'll be in 
there'll be several investment guys that follow me, at least two, and uh, they're on board now, Todd, Todd Combs and Ted Weschler. We had a home run with both of them. Uh, we got better than we deserve, but Charlie and I like that. Uh, and they, it's, it's unlikely they do anything, very unlikely they do anything in derivatives, although I wouldn't restrict them from doing it because they're smart people. And sometimes derivatives get mispriced. So, but it, it's not, it's not going to be a huge factor at, at Berkshire. I think we're going to do really probably quite well with the derivative positions that we, that we have. We've done fine with the ones that have expired so far, and and I, I like the positions, but uh, the rules have changed in relation to collateralizing, uh, and. I don't like ever exposing us to anything uh, that would cause me to uh, worry about Berkshire's financial condition if the, if the Federal Reserve were hit by a nuclear bomb tomorrow or anything of the sort or, or Europe, you know, something terrible happened. I, we just, we think about worst cases all of the time around Berkshire. Charlie and I probably think about worst cases more than any two managers you'll ever find. And, uh, we are never going to expose ourselves to a worst case. And a requirement to collateralize things means that you are putting yourself in a position where you may have to come up with some cash tomorrow morning. And we're never going to do that on any significant scale because we don't know what tomorrow morning will bring. Jeremy? Well, we wouldn't have. The derivatives that bothered some people. We never would have entered if we'd had to sign normal contracts. We had better credit than anybody else, and we got better terms. And I think by the time that is all run off, we will have made at least $10 billion, and maybe a lot more. In other words, we're going to be very lucky we did those contracts. <laughs>